So good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth annual Student Showcase for UBA. Yay. And it's also our first time that we're hosting it in person. So we're very happy that you're here. So my name is Elizabeth Chi. I am a doctoral student um, at the Educational Psychology Program at the KD Graduate Center. And I have the honor of serving as a KBA Graduate Fellow this year and overseeing the Student Showcase. Uh, so I also work alongside with the KDA staff and other fellows to uh, plan this event. And we are so happy that it is actually coming to fruition. Right, so uh, we work closely with the presenters to prepare for today's events over the past few months. And we'd like to give shout outs to staff members, Tracy, Mia, Irina, uh, and Anna Lee Cruz for arranging today's refreshments and venue. Uh, so there are refreshments in the back, so you feel free to pick some up to bring it back to your table. Um, and I would like to give shout outs to graduate fellows, Michelle Chitz, who is in the English program, Nick Lassenbury, uh, who is in the cultural anthropology program, Dongkomo Tanti Ruki, who is in the history program, uh, Gu Jiao Dong, who is in the theater and performance program, and our fellows coordinator, Kim Kim, who is also in the theater and performance program. Um, so, we're, so thank you for, for, for making this, this event possible. Okay. So the Student Showcase is our culminating event of the year, uh, where we have a wonderful lineup of students who will present projects that they have passionately been working on. And these projects reflect their unique areas of study and illustrate the interdisciplinary nature of KBA. So before we get started, I'd like to briefly go over how the events of today will play out. Uh, so we have six presenters. Each speaker will be introduced by the KBA Academic Director, Jordi Clark Weissman. Um, and the speaker will then have 10 minutes to present the topic, followed by two minutes of Q&A. After all presentations, we will invite the Dean for KUBA, Ryan Peterson, to give the closing remarks. And right after the showcase, we will then have Senior Day, uh, where graduating seniors can pick up their regalia, mingle with others, uh, and decorate their caps. All right. So I would like, now like to invite Dr. Jody clark Weitzman, our KUBA academic director, uh, to give the introductory remarks. Thank you and welcome. So excited to be here in person and to have this event and see you all. I want to congratulate our six presenters today. They have distinguished themselves by creating their own major already, um, by creating a plan that gives them an opportunity that they don't normally have until graduate school. In addition to building rigorous programs of study, these students have also distinguished themselves as creators of knowledge and art, as you will shortly see. Um, according to research on meaningful learning experiences, undergraduate research and creative inquiry is considered a high impact practice. What does that mean? It means a real bang for your buck kind of activity. We know that this really distinguishes you in the professional marketplace when you apply to graduate schools and you can impress family and friends. Um, you come out as better consumers of research with all your skills. You speak the language of research, at least in your own respective fields. Um, you've developed critical thinking, writing, and speaking skills. Hopefully you've built some academic confidence and see yourself as a scholar. You certainly have done scholarly work. As Liz Lerman says, if you consider a big enough problem, you have to engage more than one discipline to answer it. So your projects have been an opportunity to integrate the various disciplines that you've worked with. So congratulations on that too. You've really become an expert in your area. I, before we get started, would also like to thank the fellows. Liz gave um, a shout out, but I will just let you all clap again for Liz Chi and uh, Michelle Chinitz, who is here, and Kim Kim, and um, Blanc Mall, who is here as well. So thank you all. This really is sort of the closing part of the year for the fellows. So this is a really a nice high note to come out on. So without that, uh, we already mentioned senior day. So we're going to have some fun here afterwards. But let's get started. I'd like to present the first presenter, Coco Lim. I'll tell you a little bit about her um, as Coco makes her way forward. Um, Coco is a senior at Baruch College with a double area of concentration in biochemistry and media arts in the sciences. She started at QBA in spring 2022. 
As a CUNY BA student, she has won notable scholarships such as the Barbara Price Fellowship and Thomas W. Smith Academic Fellowship. She's also a Baruch Inquiry Scholar and Macaulay Honors College student. Upon graduation, she'll be applying for medical school. Today, she'll be presenting on, and hopefully I can pronounce it, the glycolytic gene mutations on Drosophila melanogaster. <laughs> melanogaster? Melanogaster. <laughs> melanogaster. Oh, this is why I have an accent here. Okay. <laughs> this project was done um, in collaboration with Dr. Kurtz, the C. Doby. So give a round of applause for Coco. <laughs> Well, hello everyone. Today I'll be presenting on the mutations of glycolytic genes in Drosophila melanogaster and their muscle development. So first, I'm going to go over why I chose Drosophila melanogaster in the first place. And they're commonly known as fruit flies, so you'll see them when you leave your fruits out for a long time. And they're also easily stored because they're so tiny, we can just store them in our lab. And you can buy from different stock sensors for certain genotypes that you want, and you can get them shipped to you. So they're cost efficient. And also their life cycle is around 10 to 12 days, so we can have multiple generations in a short period of time. And we have a variety of different genetic tools, so we can experiment on certain chromosomes of Drosophila. So moving on, I'm focusing on muscle development specifically because our muscles are susceptible to disease. So our muscles atrophy when we have muscle disease or when you age or when we don't use our muscles as often, or if you're diagnosed with cancer or going through chemotherapy treatment, it causes our muscles to decrease in size and strength, and they're no longer at, as strong as they used to be. So I'm going to go over the muscle structure in general. If you're not familiar with our own muscles, it's actually very similar to human muscles. These are fruit fly muscle structure. So I'm just going to point out. So we have actin and myosin, and this is the uh, sarcomere. So this is the basic unit of every muscle. And this is very, very similar to our muscles. Our muscles are made out of sarcomeres, and we have actin and myosin as well. And it's highlighted in blue over here, blue over here, and then orange. So we also have Z lines that make up every single sarcomere. And our muscles, like the software, are multinucleated. So this makes the gland gasser a very good candidate organism to research on. And we have different metabolic pathways in order to produce energy, also known as ATP. And one metabolic pathway I focused on for my research was glycolysis, because we also eat our diet and it converts glucose, basically sugar, into pyruvate. So there's two different pathways that glucose can go through. It can go into the citric acid cycle, or it can become lactate. And the two enzymes that I focused on for my research was phosphofructokinase, also known as PFK, and also lactate dehydrogenase, also known as LDH. And the reason why I focused on these two enzymes was because previous studies by a Pixier lab <coughs> found that when they decreased the expression of these two enzymes, it causes the fruit flies to become flightless. So I wanted to research and tell what is the reasoning behind them losing their mobility when they grow into an adult fly. And as you can see, these two enzymes are actually in the beginning and the ending of glycolysis. So they're pretty important enzymes to look into as to how it affects their function and muscle and how we produce energy as well. So one of the methods that I did in my research was larval dissections. So what you do is you will collect certain genotypes, the larvae, and you would dissect them and you would fix the walls using pins. And then we would confocal image them and we'll stain them with antibodies so that we get some fluorescence. And this is like a dissection I did. So you can see there are six pins so that we have a clear image of all the muscles. And moving on, these are the genotypes that I use. So these genotypes were shipped from the Bloomington Stock Center. And I'm going to go over every single genotype that I did. 
So first I did PFK. If you don't remember, that is the first enzyme before in glycolysis that I emphasized. And when you do UAS PFK, that means that you overexpress PFK in that larvae or embryo. And then when we do MHC GAL4, TUB GAL80 slash with um, UAS PFK, that means that I want overexpression of PFK specifically in larval muscles. And then when I did UAS PFK RNAi, I'm knocking it down. And when I do it with GAL4 again, it means I'm knocking it down specifically in larval muscles. So for my control, I use that GFP because that just shows the Z lines that make up every sarcomere. So that's my control. I just want it generally to see how the muscle structure looks like. So I have something to compare my data to. And then I had LDH, which is the ending enzyme that I had for glycolysis before. And I knocked it down with RNAi. And then I did it specifically also in larval muscles. So some of my results that I got from my experiment was that, as you can see in these images, this is Zash GFP. If you remember, that was our control before. So these little white lines are just the Z lines of a normal larval muscle. And then these are the overexpression of PFK. And this is how the muscle looks like. And then this is the knockdown of PFK. And you can see the muscle structure over here. And then the lines again are just the Z lines. And what I did was I measured the length between the two lines and saw that we actually had a decrease in sarcomere length when you knock down PFK. And then I also did a larval crawling of the overexpression and underexpression of PFK to see maybe they're losing their mobility when they're younger as well. And there wasn't actually a big difference when we tested the larval crawling. So that's one part of the project that we're hoping to look into. Possibly, if we're seeing these differences in their sarcomere length, they must have some issues when they're a larvae. So when I did the knockdown of LDH, you can see this a little bit more clear, but this is also our control again. And these little white lines are every single Z line in every sarcomere. And I measure between the two sarcomere, um, the two Z lines to make up a sarcomere length. And then this is the knockdown of LDH. And you can see in the bar graph that there's a significant decrease as well, which is what we expected. We expected there to be a decrease in the sarcomere length because of the mobility issues that the other research lab found. And the other method that I did was I counted nuclei because like I said before, our muscles are multinucleated. So we assume that maybe if I knock down certain enzymes, there'll possibly be less nuclei fusion events. So there'll be a lower number of nuclei. So what I did was I did fluorescence of the overall structure using app GFP. This is just basic every muscle highlighted in white. And then I did staining for fluorescence of nucleus red. And this is every single nuclei in a muscle. And when I merged the two images together, you can see in green that is the muscle structure and then every single nuclei in magenta. So that helps me make sure that I know which muscle I'm counting from and the nuclei that are present. So when we compare the control and the knockdown of PFK, we actually found there wasn't a significant difference, as you can see in the bar graph over here, between the number of nuclei present between the muscles. So that is one part that we're also looking into. So for my future directions, what I'm hoping to do is I have many genotypes that I discussed before, but I wasn't able to do every single testing for all of them. And I hope to do that and complete that possibly in the future to see how maybe we might see a bigger effect for certain um, genotypes. And for my stock, I got it from the Bloomington Stock Center, but from previous research studies that found the flightless adult fly, they got it from the Vienna Genome Center. And it has to be shipped from Vienna, so it takes a whole process to get it approved by CUNY. So I hope that in the future, maybe if we get stock from Vienna, we can see more drastic changes between the <coughs> knockdown and the overexpression of certain enzymes. And I only did larval crawling testing for the genotype right now, but I hope to in the future do possibly like a jumping test or a flying test to see maybe other forms of mobility or function is compromised instead of crawling. And in the far future, 
I hope to do all the glycolytic enzymes involved in glycolysis because it can help us further into researching treatment methods for muscle atrophy and help people and prevent them possibly from having this change in their muscle structure. So thank you so much. I want to say thank you for QBA for this opportunity and my faculty mentor and the fellows that hosted it. <laughs> well, moving on. If anyone has any questions about my research, yes. <laughs> um, thank you for the presentation. You kind of made me think about muscle memory. Is that a part of your research? So our research is mostly on muscle function and not so much on muscle memory. So we just tried to see if possibly like the function of like how well it causes some like different types of mobility is affected or like possibly like the structure like that's the area that we concentrated in for my research. So we get specific genotypes from the stock center. Right. Like can you can you like put it in order to like knock down some enzyme and then I don't know do it for you or or like is it just kind of like a set thing that you have to order from? Uh, so we do order from the stock center, but sometimes we have to make the crosses <coughs> ourselves. So like the ones with specifically in larval muscles, those we had to test it and see when we image them, is there actually like any changes? Because if it's like the same thing to um, the regular genotype, that means that we probably did like a cross wrong or we have to change out the genotypes. But to get like the normal like knockdown or overexpression, we just order it from the stock center like we would from Vienna. Yes, we ideally wanted it from the Vienna one because it was uh, the one that the previous research lab did because we hope to kind of like mimic and see like is there possible changes in the sarcomere because they didn't research into that. They only researched and found that the adult flies just become flightless and we wanted to look into like the reasoning behind it. So we hope to get that. And I I think that possibly there will be more drastic changes. So I guess that's so, mm -hmm. in contact with the previous researchers. Like, could you tell them we were doing this research and like ask some questions about their, their research at all? So we actually mostly looked at their we did like a literature review of like just general glycolytic enzymes in Drosophila melanogaster. And we found that they saw, they actually did tons of enzymes and knockdown and different metabolic pathways, but we decided to focus on glycolysis because we found that it was like a vital pathway that we use and humans we use and fruit flies use as well. And it's like so highly conserved. Um, but we didn't contact the lab, but we just used the research paper that they published and went off of that in right. terms of that. Thank you so much. <laughs>
um, a little bit more in depth about why I chose this project in specific. Um, as Jody mentioned earlier, I'm a personal trainer, but I'm also a biology student, and I love to study how the crossover between the two can actually have an impact on our life. How can biochemical substances affect our fitness? Um, and and I divided up into three different categories. So endurance, yeah, um, endurance training, resistance training, and muscle recovery. So additionally, another reason why I chose this project, it, um, this um, specific herbal substance, is because um, in the fitness world, there's a big emphasis on taking supplements. Like I'm sure that if any of you guys are into fitness, you've heard of creatine, you've heard of protein powder, you've heard of amino acids, and a lot of these um, supplements are actually synthesized in a lab. But I was curious to learn, how can we use natural sources to advance our fitness? So a little bit of background on ashwagandha. So historically, in Ayurveda practices, Ayurveda is an Indian um, traditional form of medicine that we've used for thousands of years. So in Ayurvedic practices, ashwagandha, which is over there on the right, um, was used um, in order to promote vitality, to promote strength, to um, as a sexual a stimulant, um, and it was also used to treat inflammation in joints. Um, it was um, drank as tea, or it was ground up into a powder and um, rubbed on inflammation on joints. Um, however, today in Western medicine, in the past hundred years, Western medicine has actually picked up on all these benefits. And today it's used to enhance sleep. It is used to treat anxiety. It's even used in some cancer medications. And, but there is very little research on how it actually has an effect on fitness. Um, so that was also another exciting factor to me. Um, there's very limited studies on how ashwagandha can affect fitness, and that's why I was so excited to research it. Um, so, yeah. Oh yeah, another thing that I wanted to mention is, is that today in stores, it's mainly um, sold as like a tablet form, an extract. You can also buy it as a powder and make it into tea. Whereas in Ayurvedic practices, um, it's mainly just used as a tea, or um, as a cream. So, so a, little back, a little bit more background on ashwagandha. Um, if you know anything about organic chemistry, it's a steroidal lactone. Um, and the steroidal lactones are up there on the right. It's just descriptive of the, of the chemical structure of ashwagandha. And um, the mechanisms of this is still unknown. But I think that if we explore a little bit more about its structure, we can maybe understand the mechanism that it uses to help um, improve fitness. Um, the active ingredient is with analytes. Um, in most of the studies that I've reviewed, they use KSM-66 ashwagandha um, extract tablets that had 5% with analytes. So um, another thing that I wanted to note is that it's not safe for pregnant women and for people who are taking immunosuppressants because ashwagandha can actually um, help imp like rev up your immune system. So. If you're if you're thinking about taking ashwagandha, don't if you um, fall under any, any under the, any uh, under any of those categories. Excuse me. Um, additionally, the re there's no like specific recommended intake. However, studies have used us under up to a thousand milligrams of ashwagandha, and it was safe. So, so I divided up the way that ashwagandha can affect fitness into three different categories: cardiovascular endurance resistance training, and recovery. Um, and I reviewed a few different studies, and I'm going to share with you what I found based off of those studies. So the first study that I, I reviewed was um, a study done on athletes, cardiovascular athletes. So uh, for those who are not familiar with this term, cardiovascular exercises include running, biking, swimming. Those are all cardiovascular exercises. And a good way to measure that is by measuring VO2 max. So VO2 max is the um, maximum oxygen consumption that your body uses when you're exercising. And the more oxygen that you use, the more efficient your muscles are in doing the cardiovascular exercise. So they took um, around 50 athletes, both men and women, and um, they gave them ashw ashwagandha supplements for about eight weeks. And they found that at the end of the eight weeks, there was a relative increase in VO2 max, um, which indicates that ashwagandha can have a possible positive correlation on cardiovascular endurance. 
The second, oh, additionally, in that study, they also um, gave a survey to all of the participants, asking them how they felt after the run. And the, the group that had ashwagandha supplementation actually um, reported that they recovered more quickly. So goes to show that it can also potentially enhance in cover, recovery. Um, the second category that I wanted to talk about is resistance training. So there was another study done. It was exclusively on men. Um, and it was also an eight week study. They gave ashwagandha tablets every single day. They, they took ashwagandha tablets every single day in addition to having a work, an identical workout regimen. Every participant had a, an identical workout regimen and there was, again, a control and a, um, an experimental group. They found that there was a relative increase in um, muscle strength and muscle size and a decrease in body fat at the end of the eight weeks um, in both groups. However, the ashwagandha group um, had um, higher um, relative muscle strength and high, but a greater increase in muscle size in addition to lower body fat percentage levels. So that, that also goes to suggest that ashwagandha supplementation could also help with resistance training. In the same study, they um, tested for creatine kinase levels. So this is a hormone that is excreted by our muscles as a result of being, of being fatigued or sore. And the way it works is that it rips apart, your, when your muscles are ripped apart as a result of exercise, which, which is actually what causes the soreness feeling, um, your muscles release this, um, and this enzyme or hormone to um, help simulate, um, what's the word, like help, help, help the recovery. And as a result, um, they found that the, ash, the group that was supplemented with ashwagandha had lower levels of creatine kinase, which indicated that they recovered more quickly from their exercise. Um, and additionally, there were other studies done on testosterone and DHEA levels in, um, in, in, these, in these athletes. And, they, and testosterone and DHEA are both hormones that are linked to, that are positively correlated to cardiovascular endurance and um, resistance training. So they found that there were higher testosterone and DHEA, DHEA levels in the ashwagandha supplemented group. So last thing I want to talk about is potential future direction. So um, most of these studies that I mentioned were less than 100 people and only eight weeks long. So I think that it would be beneficial to do a clinical trial on, on the effects of ashwagandha on fitness and examine how exactly, um, the, how exactly ashwagandha ha, um, exhibits its effect when it's over a long-term period. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the mechanism of, of that ashwagandha helps us, we still don't know. So that is definitely something that needs to be researched. Um, and I think it, like more the more research on how it specifically affects women should also be done. Because as I mentioned earlier, the resistance um, training study was only done on men. Um, and lastly, I think another good future direction would be, does it have the same effect when used as a cooking ingredient? Um, we know that sometimes when you cook something, it, change the, it changes the chemical structure. So if we use ashwagandha in cooking, will it exhibit the same effects that it does as a pill or a tablet? When it, as, because when it's in a pill or a tablet, it's in a very concentrated form. Um, I hope to continue my studies with uh, Professor Yang this, study, this summer and potentially um, conduct a literature review specifically on clinical trials that were done on ashwagandha, and we'll see what I come up with. Um, so today, in summary, we learned about how ashwagandha can have an effect on cardiovascular training, um, resistance training, and on, and on recovery. Um, and if you need a personal trainer to help you with any of those things, you can follow me on Instagram with Moods with Jewels. Um, I'd like to thank CUNY-BI for giving me this opportunity and for my mentors, Professor Yang um, and uh, Dr. Kai, who's like somebody at the group that helped me out also. So thank you so much. <laughs> Any questions? No? Okay. Oh, oh I see, okay, yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. I'm very much interested in fitness and I think you're with the robust. I really thought that the tradition that the herbal medicine and the European herbal medicine was the reason that the herbal 
Yeah, so I mentioned earlier um, that, so the, there's no specific, in the traditional form, like it, it was very hard to find a specific dosage that, that was given because in traditional medicine, they're not exactly like measuring everything um, to like a scientific, uh, uh, like in, according to Western standards, they're not like measuring it. Um, that was a little bit hard to find. As I mentioned also that um, there were some studies that that gave the supplement for up to a thousand milligrams a day and all the fi vital signs were uh, of the patient, of the um, participants were the same. So, um, I mean, and in the studies that I reviewed specifically on fitness, they were given six um, 600 milligrams a day. So, I mean, too much of anything is not good. I personally would not recommend going over that dosage. Um, there aren't any studies currently speaking about the dosage um, that is unsafe. So I, to answer your question, there's still a little bit of variability. Um, and, but yeah, I think, you know, everything in moderation. And, it, and I also another thing that's important to mention um, I, that I mentioned earlier, pregnant women should not take it because it, it um, showed to um, have like cause spontaneous miscarriages. And because ashwagandha is actually um, an, a, like immunomodulant, which is something that helps rev up your, your immune system. If you're taking a medication that's supposed to suppress your immune system, or if you have any autoimmune disorders, um, you should speak to your doctor before taking it because it may be unsafe. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. It's now my pleasure to introduce Brittany Lugo, who's going to come up. She's pursuing a bachelor's degree with a concentration in medieval and Renaissance history at CUNY BA, building on her associate's degree in liberal arts with an emphasis in social and behavioral science from CUNY Medgar Ever College, Medgar Evers College. Brittany is a member of several prestigious organizations, including the National Society of Leadership and Success, the Electus Society, Phi Alpha Theta, and the National Historical Society, and has received numerous awards, including the Dean's List and Thomas Smith Fellowship. Brittany's research focuses on exploring the criteria used to categorize individuals during the classical period found within early Christian texts and how these conclusions aided in the formation of racial ideology. Her presentation titled Revisiting Racism, Exploring the Presence of Africans and the Categorization of Individuals During the Classical Period is an insightful investigation into this topic. So we welcome Brittany. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to present this to you today. I'm very excited for the opportunity. Um, like Jody said, my topic revolves around a paper that I did last semester exploring the presence of Africans during the classical period, specifically in, in Christian texts. There it goes. Um, how I came to this was um, I was watching a TV show. I'm a huge fan of Game of Thrones, Lord of the Rings, and there were new adaptations that were coming about. Uh, House of the Dragon and to get the title of the Lord of the Rings one. one. Um, but the main topic that came out of that were there were new entities. They were exploring the idea of incorporating people of color into these time periods and the internet lost its mind. The common thread that came from that was African American people of color did not exist during these time periods. And if they did exist, they weren't in these prominent positions. So I wanted to explore that a little more. Um, I found out that previous discourse um, claimed that racism did not exist before the transatlantic slave trade. Um, what I also found out was that research on Africans focused on Africa's interaction with Europe, but not specifically on Africans within Europe. Um, I found that, as I continue my deep dive, I found that the center of how Africans were perceived could be traced to early Christian texts. 
Therefore, I hypothesize that the standardization of Christianity during the second to fourth century formed ideologies around ethnic differences that aided in the groundwork for what would come to be known as racist ideology in the 17th century and beyond. Now, my particular interest isn't in transatlantic slave trade. However, in my slight deep dive, I found out that pro-slavery ideology centered on religion as well. That is to say that many pro-slavery defendants use the Bible and their understanding of the Bible as the reason for why Africans were supposed to be slaves. So this led me to four people that I will base my research on, and I came up with these research questions. How were Africans perceived and categorized during the classical period? What was the basis for their categorization if it wasn't race? How did the codification of Christianity affect this categorization? And then how did these perceptions in these documents lay the groundwork for future racial discourse? So the first person that we have here is Aristides. He is a second century Greek scholar. And in his Apology of Aristides, he says that this is clear to you, O King, that there are four classes of men in this world, barbarians and Greeks and Jews and Christians. And what we see happening here are the acknowledgement of separate groups. We have barbarians, Greeks, Jews, and Christians. And there were specific ways that people fell within these, and that is how they moved throughout their life. Now, while we have that in the second century, what we have to ask after that is what is a Christian identity, since I'm focusing on early Christian texts. In 313 AD, we have Constantine, and he accepts Christianity into the Roman state. In 325 AD, they come up with the Creed of Nicaea that says, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten from the Father, only begotten, that is, from the substance of the Father. Now, what all of this just means is it basically makes a performative identity to Christianity. If you are a Christian, these are the tenets that you believe in, this is what you adhere to. And that became one of the identifying factors for differences during this period. The next person is St. Jerome. St. Jerome is a scholar that appears in the third century and his main um, involvement into Christianity were translations, interpretation. In his homilies, he says, names are given to individual things that we may be able to identify them. So going back to what we talked about, what is a Christian identity, during this time period, identification of an individual was almost just as important as your status because that helped to lead into it. He leads strongly into names and further within his text, he goes, truth in Hebrew means Ethiopian, that is black and dark, one who has a soul as black as his body. On its own, that phrase doesn't really lend to any type of racist thought or anything of that nature. But when we think about this need for identification that is so important to individuals at this time, they're specifically marking and categorizing the Ethiopian as a specific thing, going into color and going into their geographic location. For the final um, scholar, we have Oregon of Alexandria, who does the same thing as St. Jerome, his interpretation and translation of texts. In his Songs of Songs, he says, I am indeed, he, he gives a translation of, I am indeed dark or black as far as my complexion goes, or daughters of Jerusalem. So once again, he's introducing color and marking it as the individual. And what he brings in here, really specifically, is this idea of Jerusalem, which in Christianity is considered a holy site. And it has great acknowledgement if you are a Christian. And he places this individual against Jerusalem, not only by her color, but making it known that she does not reside there. So in conclusion, um, my research has shown that the classical period identification was very important. While identification was based on religion, it grows to encompass physical appearance, 
it grows to encompass geographic locations, which then become and lead to stereotypes and biases that then get imprinted from this period and beyond. Um, I believe that my research is helpful um, just because it helps to shed further light on the experiences of other people during other uh, time frames. It um, helps to aid in this mindset of a global history where we start to focus on non-European history. Um, I hope and endeavor to continue this um, in graduate school. I am pl planning to attend um, and very excited to have presented this to you today. Yes. Are there any examples of self-identification or any expression of self-identity from um, the Ethiopian perspective or from like, the on from a Greek or um, like a traditional Christian text that you come across to complement and counteract the do you mean do have there been individuals that have self-identified as Christian or as one of the other? Yes. Um, I would probably say yes. I would probably have to do like another deep dive into like my various notes to give you a specific person or individual. But I can say probably with like 60 to 65 percent certainty that the Oregon and St. Jerome have identified as self-Christian and there are probably texts that support that. Um, I wanted to uh, ask about like um, your idea about categories of the way to identify, and I'm wondering about in, like through history when have we moved from using categories as a form of identification to a source of reduction? Um, in the sense that those categories kind of become more than just a label, and that it's it doesn't encompass the intersectional identities of these Like when does identification transcend? Um, I would probably say anything kind of modernly. I would say I feel like identity is this way of transcending. Um, during this period of time, there's a huge um, prevalence on sameness, I would say, also as a way of identification. Anything that it's viewed as different or contrary is something to be feared. So that's why identification kind of presents the way that it does. Oh, if you're a Christian, I know that. I can trust that you believe and then also you look just like me because when Christianity starts to become more prevalent, it's in Rome. So that was a certain set of people that looked like each other. And now, now we can see that there are Christians all over the world. In the beginning, it was about that sameness, about that way of identification. As I feel like we move into things that are more contemporary, um, you know, we know that identity is a construct. You know, it's just people's way of putting you into a box, but we're all different and have different facets. So I'm not going to the question for another one. Okay. I was wondering in your research, did you ever come across the story of Ham? I did. Yeah. Yes. That is a doozy. <laughs> I lived in Africa for several years, yeah. and, and one of the niche the missionaries had used that as a justification for colonialism and a lot of its ills. Um, and that was one of the that popped up. Um, oh, it definitely did. And it kind of related. I was going back and forth if I wanted to use that, um, but then I think I would have had to have structured this differently. Um, but for those of you that don't know, um, Ham was a son, one of uh, Noah's sons. I'm blanking, I always blank on the third one. Um, but um, he, when they were on the ark, Ham uh, did something that he wasn't supposed to do or that was seen as negatory. And as punishment, he was given Africa. And so also when the ark um, makes land, each son was given a location. So kind of that kind of threads into the same thing. Ham got Africa, one son got Europe, one son got Asia. Um, and that's just kind of like a little bit, sorry. But I did, and it's very interesting. Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to add one more um, piece of information. Uh, Ethiopia is very tribal. So it's a strictly different language. And one people in certain villages want to understand others. And then they should 
the influence of yet uh, the claim of Ethiopian Jews and their claim that they're the most tried. Did you touch on that with your previous study? I did not, only because the focus was um, Christian text, specifically within Europe. But that is definitely something that I would like to explore more is the idea of Ethiopians and from their perspective. So let's start here, expand there. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. I'd like to call up Christina Marks who is in her final semester of the CUNY BA at Hunter College. Her dual concentrations are the history and philosophy of art, mentored by Dr. Sandra Shapche, and dramaturgy, mentored by Dr. Dong Xing Chang. Christina is a Thomas W. Smith Fellow and is looking forward to commencing her doctoral studies in art history under Dr. Kerry Levine at UNC Chapel Hill in the fall. That, yes, it's hot for that. <laughs> doctors in the house and future doctors. Um, last summer, Christina participated in the Stanford Summer Research Institute, researching the film Mono Lake, while developing an interdisciplinary research methodology that included archival, field, and creative elements. For her current work, advised by Dr. Susanna Cole, Christina continues to weave methods to research three works of ecological art in Manhattan. Each piece represents a distinct resistance to the economic association of use value as applied to land and highlights the access sustaining Manhattan's visual and ecological identity through space and time. That is the horizontal and the vertical. Please welcome Christina. I'm not as good at using the clicker as everybody else has been. <laughs> All right. The visual experience of Manhattan from an internal, external, or aerial perspective is one dominated by the rigid vertical geometry of the skyline. The modernist icon of the skyscraper complements the rigidity of the gridded east-west streets and north-south avenues and is in large part responsible for Manhattan's seeming rejection of natural space. While the logic of the grid can be obscured by these monoliths as they present a seemingly impenetrable but vertical wall, it still dictates our spatial understanding of urban life as the grid plots the cardinal directions, carving compacted landfill to be commodified. So the buildings plot their way up into the atmosphere, commodifying airspace as potential profit, possible balconies, maybe a river view, you know, the next supervillain lair. Um, <laughs> this new landscape traded the swampy forested ecological history of the island as stewarded by the Lenape people, filling it with landfill and waste to find architectural foundations in the refuse of the colonial population. The grid uh, creates the phenomenon, which you can see on the right, known as the Manhattan Henge. Um, this image on the right is the canyons of towers along the main east-west thoroughfares. 34th Street is one of them. And it frames the sunset during one short period of the year, which we're actually coming up on, so keep your eyes out. The happy accident of Manhattan Henge points out that despite its resolute urbanity, um, extreme human intervention into the landscape and celebrated construction, even Manhattan is part of the larger movements of the planet, always connected to and contributing to what the natural world is and helping to define the co-creative relationship between humanity and the more than human world. Use value, usually associated with the commodities of capitalism. Culturally, as well as economically, value is explicitly linked to profit, gain, and satisfaction. The environmental movement has, at many terms, placed the emphasis of our responsibility to the stewardship of any space in reference to what we get out of it. 
trying to justify environmental action through the use of economic language and theory. Carbon pricing is a clear example of this. However, this approach is effective in some ways. It maintains the environment as a commodity, which leaves it always at the mercy of capitalism. The presence of several key works of earth, land and environmental art uh, of the earth, land and environmental art movement of the 1960s through the late 20th century are what I'm concerned with. And these particular pieces challenge the challenge and reinforce at the same time the thrusting bodily verticality of the dominant skyline and the rigid predictable gridded plan. Across Manhattan, three particular works of land art exist in their specific localities, claiming a relationship to and purpose for the site, claiming what could be called a use value. I look at all three of those in my full research, but today I'm going to focus on Wheatfield, a confrontation. Wheatfield, a confrontation, uh, by the artist Agnes Denys, who was Hungarian born, but has done a huge amount of work in the US, was a cultivated two acre field of landfill that was being prepared to be sold in the multi-million dollar real estate deal to become what is the mixed use um, space of Battery Park City. Situated on the edge of the Hudson and shackled by the financial district to the east of the site, Wheatfield produced a crop of golden wheat in the shadow of the Twin Towers and Lady Liberty. That crop was then distributed for consumption. Some of uh, Denny's, Denny's Wheatfield uh, explores the real possibility of reclaiming what is considered wasted land for the sustenance of the human body and soul. Some of her pieces do this figuratively, but Wheatfield does this through the production of actual food <laughs> grown and proposed to combat the pressing issues of hunger and poverty that she was seeing around her in both the city and the world. The agricultural action of sow, grow and reap replicates the product oriented consumer capitalism that thrives in the surrounding area, the financial district of lower Manhattan. It bucks the cycle of production in one very important way, though. There's no financial profit as a goal. Back to the maps for a moment of the history of the site. Like many mid-century projects in New York City, the proposal for Battery Park City was anchored in revitalizing urban space in decline and was spearheaded by old New York money and politics, namely the Rockefellers. The Battery Park City Authority was created under the, under the jurisdiction of uh, New York City in 1968, after a suggestion by the Rockefellers, and proposed and approved their master plan for the Battery Park City mixed-use commercial, public and residential spaces in 1969. At the core of the project proposal was the potential for significant ongoing income for the city from the sale of the land and ongoing uh, income from the commercial rents on the site. The allure of converting public space into profitable, profitable commercial zones continues today as a trend US-wide and threatens much of the remaining green space of Battery Park City as it stands today. This proposal was to be a trident of solutions. Firstly, to the degradation of the coastline around the Hudson Piers, which were in a state of severe disrepair. Secondly, as an income stream for the city, which was fiscally running out of steam, to put it lightly. Um, and thirdly, to do uh, to what to do with the refuse from the construction debris of the World Trade Center's construction. I'm gonna skip a couple. All right. Awesome. From 1969 to 67 to 1979, over the New York City major financial crisis, the site was built up into landfill, destroyed the piers along the Hudson, and fleshed out a section of Manhattan's coastline that you can see is not present in the 1811 grid, in the um, which was the establishment of the gridded system of Manhattan. 
even the boundaries on the island at this point are human interventions. These constructed parameters uh, in relationship with the escalation of climate change are major factors in New York's flood and hurricane vulnerability. Most of the refuse used in the landfill was construction waste from the massive building project of the original World Trade Center's seven buildings, the two, of, the two most iconic uh, of which were, of course, the Twin Towers. They feature prominently in uh, documentation of Denny's project, Wheatfield. The World Trade Center project was like Battery Park City, spearheaded by the Rockefellers, but maintained under the management of New York City and New Jersey's Port Authority until the late 90s when the complex was privatized. Denny's crop of wheat was harvested out of the ground that was littered with the excess soil from foundation sites, from foundation sites of those buildings. Demolition waste and general trash created by the installation of what I refer to as the Vatican City of Capitalism, uh, which is the World Trade Centers in the financial district of Lower Manhattan. This was ground removed from the earth to be replaced by spaces that dictate the use value of entire nations of people as commodities, contributing explicitly to the cycles of world and national hunger that Agnes Denny's wheat field was confronting. Going to skip through a few. You can see some images of the field. This is the field in harvest. While well, Wheatfield presents a clear challenge to the idea that use value of land in Manhattan is for profit and profit only, the formal and agricultural properties of the piece are in an interesting relationship with the social, architectural and political structures that uphold that idea. This is not new, artists referencing the grid. This is Piet Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie from uh, the early 40s which is working with the map of the grid to create this really dynamic and exciting representation of what it feels like to walk around in this very constructed space. Agnes Martin is another artist who worked in New York and worked with a, a grid formation. Olivia Lang calls this grid the radiant net in her magnificent book, Everybody, a book about freedom, she writes about Martin's grids. Despite its liberatory effects, the grid is manifestly about control. Though it induces an experience of abstraction, even borderlessness, it's an art composed of fixed and rigid boundaries. Another one of Agnes Martin's paintings titled Wheat. Denny's clear field replicates none of the ambiguity of the grid, but instead has this very distinguished border. It's a field, it's a, it's a quadrilateral. It's the same, almost the same size and runs in almost the same directions as a city block. The long sides are east-west, the short sides are north-south. With the logic uh, of the use of farming equipment for efficient seed sowing and the reaping of the harvest, these lines are created <laughs> that dictate where you look in the same way that in a, an apartment building, you have windows and corridors that dictate your lines of vision. Formally, if not politically, Agnes Denny's Wheatfield sits in a surprising complement to the architectural and urban philosophies that grew out of the European sensibilities that came to reshape the very borders of Manhattan. I'm wrapping up now. Um, on the site at the moment, there continues this idea of urban farming with the Battery Park Urban Farm. It's been running for 13 years and was instigated by a local high school to the site. Unlike the wheat field, it's not a monoculture. It's not just one species. It's a whole system of volunteers, of different kinds of crops, of different redistribution. Again, that reframes this idea of use value of the land. It doesn't have to be sold for it to be valuable. 
While these fields stand under skylines dominated by different World Trade Center trademarks, their dedication to the community and cycles of harvest rather than Lydia commodity production defy their proximity to the capital city of capital. The more than human world is in deep relationship with the human construction of New York City. It's present in the butterfly weed that springs up in the cracked sidewalks and the celestial phenomenon of Manhattan Henge the magnificent systems of oyster filtration that help to clean the sometimes putrid waters of the sewage polluted East River. The artists I was looking at were asking us to reevaluate how we quantify and commodify the land that we live with. And today I, I wanna ask the same question. What do you think our city is worth? Or is it in MasterCard's words, priceless? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your time. Any questions? The farm that you mentioned at the end, who owns it? And then are those being sellers for profit or are they simply giving away those shelters? It's the crops that are produced are distributed to the volunteers who work um, on the site and any excess, it goes to um, goes to charities that are focused on um, food access and sustainability. Um, and it's owned by um, the battery, which is a kind of it's kind of like a Central Park Conservancy. It's run by um, private citizens. Um, but receives a small amount of funding from the city. So it's, it's, in, it's in this weird gray area of both public and private um, kind of effort. Uh, it's a complicated little pocket of New York City politics. So it, um, that urban farm was um, installed after the, uh, after a, another massive construction project, the um, South Ferry Wharf Station. Yeah. Um, and it is right by the, right by the road. If you, if you walk from the Wharf Station and you kind of um, stay to the north of the park, it's right by the road. Um, but there's a, there's a block of larger trees that mean it's, it's harder to see. Um, interestingly, a lot of the green space in, in the battery in the park is cut off. So you can't lie down on the grass. You can't like access it. And so that blocks a lot of access to the urban farm, making it this again, kind of odd space that's pu both public and exclusive. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Saida Tabasam and to tell you a little bit about her. She's a senior in the Macaulay Honors College program at Brooklyn College, pursuing her Kinney BA area of concentration in computer science and society, which combines the technical skills of computer science with ethics and urban studies. Aside from her academic passions, she enjoys experiencing the arts and culture of New York City. Her presentation focuses on user experiences of the FloodNet dashboard and aiding community organizing and engagement. So please welcome her. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to present my final project, my final thesis project, um, which is titled From Information to Action, The Role of Data Communication and Flood Management in New York City. Um, so I also want to um, thank my advisor, Daniel Schaub, who is a professor at, of sociology and environmental um, 
Sociology and Environmental and Earth's um, and Environmental Sciences at the Grad Center and Brooklyn College. So in my research, we were looking at mainly two research questions. Um, one being, what are the key challenges and opportunities for effective data communication with the FlugNet data dashboard, which I'll explain later. <laughs> and also, how can these impact the project's ability to inform decision making and community action? A little background about floods um, and also why this project is important to me. So I come from Silat, Bangladesh, which is one of the most flood prone regions in the country and in like the recent years, um, especially in 2022, um, so experienced like one of the worst floods um, in history, and it impacted like over 4.3 million people in the country. And every year since 1988, um, there has been a significant flood in Bangladesh. And obviously, this is important to me. I have family there. Um, I have roots there. And I've also been thinking about my own personal studies and how I can use my knowledge of computer science and sociology in aiding this and also coming up with solutions. And I also thought about how this isn't just a problem in Bangladesh, this is also a problem in New York, because floods are the most widespread natural disaster and are predicted to just yeah, be exacerbated in um, frequency and um, intensity, especially for cities which um, we lack, kind of lack the infrastructure and drainage systems. Um, that uh, can handle heavy rainfall. You might have seen this. We've had a lot of like rainstorms recently um, and flooding, which has just been very um, devastating. And a way to address this has been the FloodNet, um, the FloodNet project. The FloodNet is a wireless system um, designed to connect real-time data on flood conditions. It is low cost, open source, and self-sufficient in power and drain. Uh, and data transmission. So here is a picture of one of the FloodNet sensors in Guanis, um, in Brooklyn. It also consists of communities, researchers, and the New York City government agencies working to better understand the frequency, severity, and impact of flooding in New York City. Um, it's a collaboration with CUNY, NYU, and New York City government agencies. Um, and my project specifically is looking at user experience and user interfaces. So those of you who are not familiar with user experience or UX, um, it's basically a person's subjective experience of interacting with a product or a system or a service. Um, and then UI is the point of human computer interaction. So this can be like display screens, it can be a keyboard, um, um, a mouse, or just the appearance of a desktop. So in my research, I was looking at some of the um, just like guiding principles for like best UI practices. Um, and I came across this um, Jesse James Garnett's Elements of User Experience. And he synthesizes his um, framework into this uh, diagram. So basically, we're looking at different um, planes of design. First, we have the surface, which is like the visual design, which is what you're seeing. Um, then we have like, the skeleton, which includes like the interface design and navigation design. So when you're clicking on a website, like what is the natural points um, of clicking? So like what are the buttons that are there um, and how are they designed? It's basically split up into two different sections, looking at like hypertext, which is just the basic plain text, and then looking at how it's presented. And in my research, I was thinking about, um, so you'll see later the FloodNet dashboard, how can we redesign this to think about user needs in a way that's not, in a way that's like intuitive and also um, in a way that includes accessibility, because I feel like that's sometimes an afterthought, but should be one of the main things you consider when designing um, any sort of system, but especially climate information systems. So, um, so yeah, so climate change websites, what I've realized in my research is it kind of assumes knowledge and can hinder user experiences. Sometimes there's like jargon that you don't understand. Um, sometimes when you look at a map, you don't really know what to do. Um, and so I was looking into accessibility and how to just better communicate um, the information that's there. So I was looking at the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, the WCHG, and what I found with the FloodNet data dashboard is it's really lacking um, some things like 
text alternatives, the ability to have like screen readers there or like um, like having Braille or um, just a simpler language or even like having like a dictionary option or something like that. Um, another thing is like there's no way to really understand where the navigation is. You'll see later when I show you. Um, and this is really important because effective communication is really necessary when we're thinking about like community action, um, how can communities engage with this data, and also like um, how they can advocate for having like flood sensors in their own communities or um, just like funding to better serve them. Uh, so some of the improvement suggestions um, were having things like multiple languages, having uh, noise filters, and use case requirements. And this really comes from um, co-creation. So um, that's when like the user and the researchers are working together to kind of think about like, like what do the users really want? I feel like when you're designing something, you don't really know that. And that's another big thing with um, UX. Since it's so personal, um, it's hard to design something that can work for everyone. Um, so this is something we're thinking about in our project. And lastly, we were engaging with environmental justice. Um, so EJ, so um, EJ has its roots in the displacement of Native Americans and especially in the civil rights movement. Um, it, it emerged as a response to the disproportionate burden of environmental pollution and hazardous waste on low income communities, especially in Warren County, North Carolina in the early 1980s. And the US EPA uh, Environmental Protection Agency defines it as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, culture, education, or income, with the respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So in the context of flood and natural disaster, EJ highlights the importance, uh, the importance of considering a wide range of fa factors uh, beyond just property damage when we're thinking about um, floods and flood risk. Things like public health, things like me mental health, uh, the effects of trauma, uh, and the interruption of public services. So I, am, I aim to highlight the ways that UI and UX can aid and foster meaningful involvement in um, environmental justice. So we're using a mixed methods methodology uh, where we were having focus groups led by Hannah, which is, who is a um, postdoc uh, at NYU on flood, the FloodNet project. And we were also looking at uh, some ACS uh, census data of the flood, FloodNet population. Uh, we were mainly looking at like, disability status and language, but also demographics. Um, so what I found through the ACS data is that uh, a large number of the population um, indicated that they had a disability of some sort, many with a vision difficulty or a hearing difficulty. Um, and then when we were looking at the language side, we saw that 49.8% of the population um, was speaking Spanish at home. So just adding the ability to translate the, um, the report into Spanish would be a huge benefit for people um, and it would be a huge stride in having equitable um, participation in FloodNet and in flood uh, data communication. So this is what the current FloodNet data dashboard looks like. Um, and I want to highlight that this is being reimagined and also um, uh, we're actively working to make it better. But when you look at it, um, there's not that many navigation tools. You don't really know what to do. If you click on the, um, the little dots, it will give you um, like it'll give you a graph of the sensor and if there's an uptick. Um, in funding. And what I did was I used Figma to reimagine this uh, dashboard with the best practices in mind, with the US best practices in mind. So I have this navigation um, toolbar which um, has like methodology, has resources you can um, get involved with, and also has things that users are familiar with, such as like the weather the, in the area. Um, because what I've also realized with UX is like we really like when there's things that we already recognize and not something brand new. Uh, so we can have the map, but then we also have like pictures. Um, another part of the FloodNet team um, works with Community Flood Watch, which is um, neighborhoods reporting uh, floods using pictures. 
And so there's an ability to report, there's ability to contact emergency services, and there's this main part which um, was the accessibility setting. So when you click on the accessibility setting, it'll pop up this um, accessibility menu which has things like speed meters or the ability to highlight links, uh, or even again, like I said, the dictionary, or even having bigger text. Um, and especially having this ability to change languages from English to other languages. So some of the key takeaways were, again, that accessibility, especially language apps, but should be a key consideration in designing climate information databases and websites, not just on that. And that Flipnet really has this uh, powerful ability to provide real-time alerts, uh, assist in flood, post-flood recovery, and aid in long-term resilience planning. And so, like, citizen science and community participation can further this, and especially when we're thinking about environmental justice um, and equity in decision making and climate action, and how the current flood the, the dashboard could benefit from UI and UX best practices, such as the addition of a navigation bar, photos, um, accessibility menu, and the ability to report um, incidents and get help in a major flooding event. Um, have you done any user testing on the newly proposed um, layout on the website? Like, have you read through actual people using it in how you do that? Um, no, so what we have, like what I designed is basically like a prototype. Um, the next steps would be to engage the FlipNet team. I've already showed them the design, they like, like it, um, but we're really working on, um, the focus groups are really looking at um, like how people engage with maps in particular and data visualization. So right now we're just in the very much like, um, like designing process rather than like testing, but I think that's coming up. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you use like you sample one group um, people. Um, it was like between like what age group did you use? Well, I, I wasn't doing the focus groups um, in particular, but um, Hannah on this project, she was doing focus groups um, that ranged from people um, of all all over New York City with all different um, backgrounds on flood knowledge um, that are not in like flood net um, like sensor areas, she just like, she did like a snowball testing where like, she asked anyone who was interested. Um, and yeah, so the age range is like 18 and the oldest participant was like 70. Um, yeah, I was wondering about like, what, were there any major differences between specific age groups or the mm -hmm. age group versus like the elder group? Quick question, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, we're still looking at, the focus groups are still happening. Like this is a very much like ongoing project, so. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Anna in particular, she's looking at how people engage with different types of maps. So, like, they're looking at like heat maps. Um, they're looking at other um, like, test maps because I think like this one is not like you don't really know what to do here. Like when I like, first like that, I'm like. And kind of told me <laughs> um, so I think yeah, we're reimagining what the map looks like, and I'm excited to see what that what comes out of that. Um, so the, the focus is on on like public accessibility, but is this also um, um, are these also questions that you could take to a pool that would be for emergency services or um, like a, another group? Um, it's not necessarily public, but it's also not necessarily the scientific community who's engaged with these ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think like UX in general, we're, it's mostly looking at like a larger group, it's thinking about like how can we just um, interact with different types of products, even not, not software. Like, people like to like, kind of design mugs to like, I think that's like an interesting thing. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, my data, like, Specifically focuses on fun now, but we've been thinking more so about just like climate information about stuff in general um, and how do we design them with like accessibility as like a like a main thing rather than like an afterthought. Mm -hmm.
And our last presenter, please welcome Celine Jang, who is a new CUNY BA student starting this very semester. So she's putting herself out here early um, from their home campus, Hunter College. Their area of concentration is in arts and sustainability with the goal to learn more ways to create a more sustainable art world. We actually have a 3D presentation in real life for us here. Uh, their presentation is titled, I Love New York. It's an art project they've been working on reflecting overconsumption in New York City using found objects from the street. So please welcome. Hello, my name is Celine and I did an artwork titled, I Love New York City. Um, so what is arts and sustainability? Arts and sustainability is learning about our environment and making art in a way that is more sustainable. And through this, I focused on ways that I can create art that is sustainable while also learning about the benefits of sustainability. An example of this is um, Duke Riley's um, Grandmaster Trash, where he uses a lot of like seaborne plastics. And also in like, the Brooklyn Museum, um, he shows that he uses like those same tampons as like a fishing thing too. And then what is sustainability? Sustainability is the ability to help our future generations by maintaining and supporting our environment now. We can support sustainability by doing research on environmental issues such as climate change, pollution, overconsumption, and many other issues we face. The hope for sustainability is to seek a way to prevent um, the de depletion of natural or physical resources so that they can remain available for the long term. And the materials that I used were um, like cigarettes, trash bags, um, cardboard boxes, and other trash on the street. And I did my research by like, you know, going through the streets of New York and also by going to like different museums, such as the Brooklyn Museum, the Whitney, like the new museum, any museum that I could basically go to in New York. Um, and what is the benefits of sustainable art? So the benefits of sustainable art is to show the importance of environmental issues and give awareness of the dangers that our planet is going through so we can pr promote the reuse of items that are deemed unusable. In my research, I was able to interview students that um, about the thoughts of like the importance of using found objects in art. So I did interviews on like Hunter students, Harvison students, and family men members, which were all done in person. My creative process was trying to make art that wasn't harmful to the environment. And by doing so, I was able to see the issues with, tra with trash on the street, which I saw when I was picking it up for my project. Um, some interview um, like quotes that I have are, it gives trash a new meaning. Um, what, okay. Oh, it gives trash a new meaning. Making sustainable art is in a city is like a love letter to the city and shows an appreciation for it. Conserves resources and reduces the amount going to landfills. And making sustainable art is important because it gives raw material of beauty and encourages us to take care of our planet. My results through interviews and research with the importance of sustainable art, by doing so I was able to incorporate new techniques into my project and I was able to find an immense amount of pollution on the streets that we walk on because of the overconsumption of our society. The impact of this project is to remind us that the importance of being mindful of our consumption in our daily lives, such as fashion, shopping, shops, and using products that are not reusable. The materials we use as artists is important because we make the conscious decision to, conscious decisions from the effects of global warming and, and environmental cons conservation. And uh, here's my project, I guess, like, blown up a little bit. So when I first came up with the concept, 
I want to figure out a way to show my love for the city and by also cleaning it up in a way too. So that's why my project is called I Love New York because I mean it's the big part of it. Um, and by doing this project, I came up with a way to create a small impact on the streets around me by picking up items such as cigarettes, wrappers, bags, receipts, masks, newspapers, and straws. Um, I felt like I was doing something that gave me a repurpose to items that were considered unusable and would be typically in landfills that would not decompose. After finding all the sh um, trash on the street, I was able to collect them all together and glue them on a cardboard box that I also found on the street too. In my artwork, you can see right in the center the I Love New York bag, which shows that although we love New York, the way we treat it is by polluting it a little, like even more. And on the bottom, it also shows like the city skyline with cigarettes, which is, I try to count it, but um, I think it's about like 100 ish. Um, and surrounding it, I also try to show like a bunch of receipts by showing like overconsumption of our society. And like I show big names, which is Starbucks. Starbucks is like on the bottom, like Target, like the extra gum that's hiding beneath it. Um, and at the end of the project, I was also wearing gloves because like it's all trash. And I just decided to glue it at the end so I can use it. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Um, where did you, like, what locations in the city did you go to? And did you notice that some areas had, like, a higher concentration of certain Um, So I did a lot of, like, my trash around, like, Astoria. And I did it around, I think, Steinway. That's where I did it. But um, in that area, like, there is a lot of trash because I think there's a lot more traffic around that area, too. And I also did some by Hunter College as well. And I noticed that there's a lot more trash and stuff, especially cigarettes are like right outside of like bars and like um, anywhere that people like, you know, like they have to go outside and go smoke. Like I found so many by trees and stuff, which is kind of upsetting because you no know, trees are like for life. <laughs> and yeah. Did you always have the idea to do um, I think the I Love New York bag was like something I was trying to find and I found one on the street like by my subway so I was like perfect I'm gonna take that <laughs> so I took that and then I also like found a bunch of other trash like just all sprawled around and I think I had like in mind that I wanted to find um, things that were more like over consumed to portray it into my artwork do you have a favorite piece of art of the artwork? Did I what? Do you have a favorite piece of art of the artwork? Um, I think I like the cigarette skyline the most. I think that's my favorite. <laughs> All right. I really love um, found object art because it's like a process of kind of like contemporary urban archaeology almost mm -hmm. of like digging through all of the the detritus that we leave behind. That, signals who we are really like what we're leaving behind is who we are like our budget the objects um and i was wondering if uh we looked into the sanitation department's um city-funded artist residency position because that's the thing that exists Ooh. and there's a long history of um in new york city an artist being um, involved in the sanitation department Asking these questions, um, the cool position. Yeah, I haven't heard of it, but I'll definitely look into it now. Yeah. You get to hang out with a lot of trash, trash trucks. But for a thing, that's on steroids. Yeah, that's crazy. Cool. Oh. Yeah. And I'm kind of curious, like, how, how would you like your art to affect the local history? Um, I guess in a more political way, I guess I wanted to just show like how these bigger brands and like, I guess like the, you know, like, um, like cigarettes and like, there's also like, um, like a bottle or, um, a can that's like smushed. It's like a alcohol can. 
like a beer can or something. And I just kind of wanted to show how um, like these items that are usually targeted towards people of like poorer class um, has an effect on like our society in ways that are, you know, in our streets. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. I just really loved hearing about people's personal connection to their work. Sort of some of the inspiration was pretty amazing, whether it was reactions to people of color in Game of Thrones spinoffs, to personal connections to flood prone areas, how you've involved your lives in, in your work. It's just um, really a special thing to hear you share that. We had several themes today that um, these, the way you've organized, Liz, these sessions are just kind of brilliant, I think, um, as you could see connection from student work to student work, themes of health and justice and the arts. Um, we've taken a wonderful journey today, beginning with muscle strength and what we can learn from fruit flies and ashwagandha use and our fitness, um, different aspects, strengthening recovery. We also dove into classical philosophy, looking at racial categorization and racial identity in ancient Christian texts. Um, we looked at the grid. I, we're not gonna think of the grid um, in New York City when we see Manhattan Hands. We're not gonna think of it the same way. We'll remember what we've learned about land use, um, value as a commodity in, in New York City, um, in the art of New York, in the skyline at Battery Park. And, um, we also got to see a team experience from UXUI in an environmental justice project. That was pretty cool to see this interdisciplinary work really coming together. Um, and last but not least, um, a wonderful art project on arts and sustainability. We got to see um, their artistic process. And I love how there was an interview process, even people um, reacting to the artwork, so we, we got the full experience. So let's congratulate these amazing students. One more time. And I, I hope you learned something being able to explain your work to other folks, answering questions to see, you know, what kind of real um, research value, artistic value your, your work has. So we're super proud of you. Put on your resume that you were featured at the CUNY BA Student Showcase. Um, and we wish everyone a great end of the semester. Right. So thank you, Jody, for giving the closing remarks. And thank you again for all the student presenters. I know the feedback revision process it was long, it was lots of emails, but you did it. All right, you're here, you finished your presentation, and it's great work. And we're really proud of you. So thank you again. So the senior day is happening right after the showcase. So feel free to stick around um, and pick up your regalia, you know, decorate your caps. There's food in the back, so you can bring it back to your tables. Enjoy. Okay. So thank you.